Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. I'm Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. This is training vlog 40. We're recapping my training from five weeks out prior to my meet. In addition, we'll talk about progressive loading versus progressive overload. And first, we're gonna play some golf. If you don't like golf, just skip the next 10 minutes of the video, get to the good stuff that you might like. But if you are into golf and you wanna see me swing a golf club, we're gonna do it. All right, we're out here at Journey Pachanga, Temecula is my favorite course in the San Diego area that's not Torrey Pines. Um, yeah, we're gonna play some golf. Woo! All right, here, Journey Pachanga started out number one with a par, uh, par four, 476 yards. Pretty straight, although everything kind of goes off to the right, so I'm gonna try to go down the left side, get some wind in. You gotta send it. Absolutely perfect. As requested, down the left side, and it will actually start uh, taking off to the right a little bit. Yeah, this is Leonard, my father, <laughs> making his debut here on the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel. Ooh, yes. 286 off the tee into the fan. So that's not, and it's not really rolling, it's kind of soggy out here. We got 175 front, 200 to stick. Again, into the into it, so I'm gonna take a six iron. Troubles left the bunker, long is dead. Try to get something on the front here. But we're in the fairway, so. All right, so we're two over through, I think this is six, or this is seven, whatever. Two over, playing okay. I haven't really been playing a lot of golf. I have to beat my last round before me. Uh, anyway, this is maybe one of the signature holes out here. So this is the Mecula. <laughs> I don't know, I think you guys can see maybe the fairway down there, there's bunkers down the left. If you're even flirting with those bunkers, you're dead. We're just gonna go, try to go over the bunker, that far bunker on the right, just go over it, catch the speed slot. If we get one in play, honestly, I'm happy. <laughs> I think the last time that I caught that speed slot was like 394 on it. Long way. Should be good. Ah, uh, baby cut. Yep, right in the center. Just stop up top, top. About 120 yards in. Really good look for the bird. All right, got 137 to stick. Pins back. It's downhill, downwind. Wind off the left. All right, this is the original daddy. All the right. Pops, yes. Leonard. You bet. All right, so from one over through nine. I wish I could say the same. Yeah, sure. Yeah, they have to add a zero to it, at least. <laughs> uh, drivable par four, of course. So we'll do this whole two and then 18, see how we fared. I think everything is just fine. We're out here together, Pachanga. That's wholesome. That's 311 from here. Carry it all the way there, but I don't think we can do that. 311 carry would be pretty, pretty stout, so we'll play a nice little 
about to get on the front side of the green. That's what we call golf management. Alright, so made it onto the first cut here, but uh, you guys see the stick over there, so let's see if we can play something. I don't know, get it close. Alright, we're here at 18. Getting dark. We had it back to even. Getting dark. It is getting dark. A little windy, <laughs> a little colder. Yeah. Now we're five over. Hey. Three bogeys and a double. Back nine's not looking great, but 18. We are having fun though. Oh yeah. <laughs> All right, 18, 431 yards. Maybe see that bunker in the back right. I'm gonna try to go left of that and carry it all the way up there, have like a hundred yard shot in. It's all downhill. If I get a par, shoot 77. Great. Sounded angry. All right, so what about 310 off the tee? We got 129 left of the stick, pins back. There's like a little swale in front of it. Playing a little downwind. I'm gonna hit a gap wedge, try to fly it. 125 just right of the stick and like I said, get out of here with the car. Good. good shot. Just like that. Yeah, just like that. All right, so yeah, pretty good round out there at Pechanga, again with my handicap and how difficult that course is. Breaking 80 is a great score out there for me. It's really challenging and so I was happy to be able to put it together on camera. A little nervous, not gonna lie. Uh, but yeah, I love golf. It's great uh, to get out there and especially to, to play with my dad. Um, ton of fun. I picked it up about two years ago and uh, I was playing about three to four times a week. Uh, tapered down to once per week the last few weeks getting ready for this meet and then now I'm on no golf for the last three weeks prior to the meet. Um, so yeah. We'll get back to it after the meet. And so if you watch that and uh, you know, yeah, I know I need some work on the swing. I'm working with a coach, trying to get uh, a little more shallow, a little more from the inside and uh, fix some uh, nasty habits I picked up when I first picked up the game uh, again about two years ago. But yeah, I can get around a course okay. And uh, if you liked that, let me know in the comments below. Uh, let me know what you wanna see next week um, for training this week because the time thing. Okay, so training from five weeks out, we'll get to it just here in a second. But first I wanna talk about progressive loading versus progressive overload. So in the context of strength training, I think the central tenet of progressive loading is that you're able to increase the weight on the bar while keeping the rest of the program, all of the other constraints the same. That is the rep scheme, the volume, the rest periods, the range of motion, the exercise, etc., cetera, uh, and including the rate of perceived exertion or what other subjective metric or even objective if you're using a velocity tracker or something, uh, you're able to keep those things the same from workout to workout and increase the weight. That is a demonstrable increase in performance. You're able to progressively load the person, so increase the training stimulus without necessarily altering the training stress. The training stress is about the same. So this is gonna require us to go over some definitions. So let's talk about those now. First definition is gonna be training stimulus. These are the nuts and bolts of a program, like the exercises, the rep schemes or rep ranges, the intensity, rest periods, the tempo of the movement or velocity, range of motion, etc. This can also be conceptualized as the external load. 
The training stress is the resultant load placed upon the individual based on their current level of fitness and performance potential and everything that goes into that, like their mood, their training expectations, nutrition status, fatigue, etc. This can also be classified as the internal load and can be measured by rate of perceived exertion, changes in heart rate, etc. Fitness adaptations are the positive physiological and psychological effects of exercise, like strength, hypertrophy, cardiorespiratory fitness, improved cognitive performance, etc. Fatigue can be conceptualized as the negative physiological and psychological effects of exercise, things like soreness, muscle damage, reduced force production, tiredness, etc. Performance potential is the ratio or balance of fitness adaptations relative to fatigue at any given point in a specific environment for completing a particular task. Thus, Training stimulus produces a given training stress that is unique to the individual, which subsequently results in both fitness adaptations and fatigue. If, over a given period of time, fatigue is greater than fitness adaptations, performance declines even if fitness adaptations are accruing, they're just being hidden or cloaked by fatigue. If fitness adaptations are greater than the resulting fatigue, performance potential can be realized if the environment is correct. Overall, the goal of training is to develop and realize fitness adaptations over time. So how does this fit in with progressive overload? The principle of progressive overload suggests that the human body must be continually challenged by greater and greater training stimuli over time in order to drive fitness adaptations. If taken at face value, I would pretty much agree with that, though I think in practice this gets misunderstood and misapplied uh, because really the adaptation rate determines the rate at which the training stimuli must increase rather than the increase in training stimuli determining the adaptation rate. In other words, applying the right dose of training stimulus based on an individual individual's goals, their current fitness and performance levels, the environment, and so on, is of primary importance. If the increase in training stimulus occurs too quickly, we're likely to also get too much fatigue on board, which reduces performance potential, can increase injury risk, and may not actually lead to greater fitness adaptations anyway. Similarly, if we increase the training stimulus too slowly, the rate of fitness adaptation accrual will be decreased. In both cases, if the training stimulus is not matched to the individual's current fitness and performance potential, they're unlikely to get the best results. That can also work in reverse, that in order to get the best results, the training stimulus must be matched to the individual's current fitness and performance potential. In other words, the person's adaptation rate, which is reflected at any given point by their performance potential, should determine the training stimulus for the day. Because we have tools that allow us to determine an individual's performance potential on a given day, things like RPE, reps in reserve, bar velocity, we're able to tailor the training stimulus on every training session for every movement in order to get the right dose. If fitness adaptations have accrued relative to fatigue, then an individual will be able to add something like weight, reps, reduced rest periods, something like that, while keeping the rest of the program the same. In other words, training stimulus has gone up while training stress has stayed about the same. So RPE has stayed the same, heart rate change has stayed the same, bar velocity has stayed the same. Again, the performance potential should determine the appropriate training stimulus on a given day. So what does this look like in practice? Uh, on the left, you have me squatting 600 pounds. On the right, you have me squatting 606. They're one week apart. The bar velocity is the same. I'm still doing the same rep scheme. It's a single rep. The RPE was about the same. I rated them both at about RP8, 7.5, something like that. And so effectively, this is a demonstrable increase in performance potential that has then determined the training stimulus, the load on the bar, because everything else about the program is static. If I had had an even greater increase in performance potential, I'd add even more weight to the bar. If I would have had a decrease in uh, performance potential, I'd have to take weight off the bar. And if my tr performance potential didn't increase at all, I would have to repeat the weight. And that's fine. Again, it is the performance potential, which is a proxy for the adaptation rate, that determines the appropriate training stimulus, not the training stimulus and increase in training stimulus determining the adaptation rate. All right, last example is gonna be my deadlift here. So we have 705 on the left, 717 on the right, doing them both for a single. They should be about RP8, and we we'll look at the bar velocity, they're about the same, if not maybe a little faster on the 717. Again, this represents a demonstrable increase in performance potential, which has then determined the training stimulus. So why do it this way versus just adding weight to the bar indiscriminately or changing weight on the bar or changing rep schemes indiscriminately? And by indiscriminately, I mean irrespective of what the RPE is, what the RIR is, what the velocity of the barbell is. Well, the point is that if you are generating too much fatigue, 
out of proportion to the fitness adaptations on board, then the reality is you're trying to maximize performance on a given training session. And for most training sessions, particularly ones that are far away from a competition, a test, a meet, you're really trying to just generate as many fitness adaptations as possible over time without generating too much fatigue. If you're generating all this fatigue, just so you can have the max performance on a single session, but that session wasn't really that important, that's kind of a waste. And so I think that most of your sessions, uh, you know, should be submaximal, should be not too fatiguing, and you can only go to the well so many times before it goes dry. You'll see an example of me going to the well uh, and overshooting and trying to force weight on the bar. And I think that's appropriate when you're getting ready for a test or a meet and you can only do it for a short period of time because again, the fatigue cost is very, very high. Since I have a meet coming up though, um, I'm willing to kind of do that in some settings, not obviously all of my lifts, uh, that would not work even though I'm getting really close to the meet, but here and there, I'm okay with making that compromise. But if I was, 16 weeks out, 20 weeks out, or had no meat uh, you know, on the schedule, I wouldn't do that at all. Because again, all I'm doing is trying to maximize the performance of a single session with you know, disregard to other upcoming sessions or past sessions, because again, the fatigue that I'm gonna generate is just out of proportion to the potential fitness adaptations. Again, the take home from this is that your adaptation rate, and we can use a proxy performance potential to determine that, is what's going to determine the change in training stimulus, not the increase or change in training stimulus determining the adaptation rate. So hopefully that makes more sense from what progressive loading is. And I think where people get off track is when they hear the term overload, they're like, oh, I have to do more. It has to overload the body. Really it all has to do is stress the body enough to drive the fitness adaptations that you want. And uh, principally, it can't drive too much fatigue because if it does, then you're not gonna realize those fitness adaptations anyway. So maybe we should just call it progressive loading and get over this whole progressive overload thing. I don't know, let me know what you guys think in the comments. We can talk about it more. We do have a podcast on this and I've linked that in the description below. Maybe we'll write a long form article on this if you guys want, let me know your thoughts. Finally, let's get into some training from uh, last week, again, five weeks out. And uh, I'll be interested to hear uh, what you guys think about next week's vlog with uh, the training from four weeks out. It gets, gets a little dicey in there. All right, so this is day one, starting off, uh, again, it's a squat bar. So this is 275 kilos or 60. Six. I'm gonna do this for a single. I had done 600 the week before. Pretty happy with how that moved. That might be a last warm up. Uh, this is just a back off set. This is 220 kilos, so 484. Um, I did a couple sets of five with this. Um, just trying to get some volume in um, and make sure to keep the velocity of the barbell pretty high. So I didn't want to do anything super fatiguing, um, but I wanted to get enough volume in to sort of drive or at least support those fitness adaptations. Um, that I'm trying to get, which is strength development. Um, on the bench, this is 185 kilos, 407. That was okay. I think the pause needs to be a little bit longer. Did my back off sets here with 352. Um, at this point in my training, my bench still was not feeling great, just relative to my normal, but still gotta go to the meet. Uh, on the trap bar deadlift, I went up by 10 kilos. So this is 550. I did two sets of eight here and um, yeah, you know what I don't like about the trap bar deadlift? It just, I don't like, well, I don't like when a person walks right in front of me while I'm deadlifting, but uh, that's neither here nor there. It, it does, it just feels kind of like a weird snatch grip deadlift to me. But anyway, uh, Penlay Rose went up 10 kilos here, did 308 the previous week. This is 330. Um, did three sets of five here. I rated these like RPE six, RPE seven. So uh, this is day two, starting off with a 280 kilo 606. Set of deficit pulls. These are two inch deficits. Notice the bar coming off my legs. That's one of the challenges here. That third rep was better, but the second rep was kind of loopy. See how you do on the fourth rep. Yeah, not bad. Yeah, I rated that an eight. The plates were all falling off on the left side, even with the collars, like a collar failure. Anyway, uh, second exercise, feet up bench press. Again, this is really just trying to get you to set your arch and like maintain it even without a lot of leg drive. Cause I think some people get a little overzealous with the leg drive and they can get their butt coming off the bench. Um, so this is what, two, 281? Yeah, that's fine. Uh, and then close grip floor press. Um, I You can do these either way. You can pause them if you want with your elbow, pause your elbows on the floor, just really depends. I find that um, 
I don't really notice a difference in the weight that I'm using. Just my elbows seem to prefer like a brief pause. Uh, you can also do them with your feet off the ground or like I have them there. I don't really feel strongly either way. Some people do with their legs laying flat, but I don't think it matters. All right, this is day three, uh, 717 on the deadlift. I already showed you guys that it moved very similarly to 705 the week before. Pretty happy with that. All right, back off sets 290, so it's 638. Yeah, I can even tell from here that I'm keeping the bar on my legs pretty well. You can see my kind of shorts coming up. I should probably hold that lockout a little bit longer. Just, you know, wait for the crowd's applause. Uh, I did two sets of four here after the single. Yeah, I'm fine with that. Basically, I pull my top single without straps and then my back off sets with straps, keep my hands nice and fresh, or at least try to, especially since I tore my hand up. Uh, pin bench, that was 187.5. And back off sets, I did these at 167.5, which is 368. So yeah, I just like to stay tight when I get down on the pins, especially some of the, you know, the bar wants to like bounce and move all the way around. So if you squeeze the life out of it, it's a pretty good way to do it. Uh, JM press again with chains. Yeah, so basically I try to like bring the bar down like a bench press and then kind of roll it over my face, kind of like a skull crusher. I think it's a good way to think about it. It's really, you know, anytime you can feel the triceps, load the elbows, feel like that's gonna be good for me and my bench press, which has been trending up, which you'll see in subsequent vlogs. But this vlog was, uh, my bench was still not feeling great. Uh, so this is 230 kilos, 507 high bar squat. It's kind of high bar for me, for sure. Basically my cue on high bar is push my knees forward further than I want them to go right off the bat. So knees go further forward and try to push my hips forward on the way up. But anyway, I rated that an eight. I was supposed to hit a five at eight. I did that, took some weight off, did one more set of five. All right, on the close grip bench, this is 165 kilos. 363. Um, so yeah, I switched to a, a pause bench this following week, not here. And then also I think I'm bringing the bar down a little too low. Um, I don't really like my wrist angle here. I would like to keep my elbows in, tucked in a little bit more, but I'm not unhappy with that. Rated that five reps at RP8, did some dips, added 45 pounds. My body weight's like 210, 211 right now. And I rated these RP6. I ended up doing four sets of 10 here. So again, try to get the triceps involved, lean forward, push my chest forward and finished up with some RDLs. Did these at 190. Uh, I am, you know, really tired at this point of the week, end of the training week, five to six exercises per day. Um, big things on the RDL, again, I think, don't try to do them stiff-legged. They're not stiff-legged deadlifts. Trace the barbell down your leg, feel the steel on your, on your legs, you know, squeeze your back uh, as tight as possible and squeeze your butt at the top that, and profit. <laughs> That's how you do RDLs. Um, I like taking them down just below knee, the knee, a couple inches below the knee. That's my preferred way to do RDLs. All right, that's a wrap on training vlog 40, uh, five weeks out. Let me know what you wanna see next week when we do training vlog 41, four weeks out. Again, training gets a little dicey there, so excited to show you that, but uh, things are rolling. We're getting closer to the meet and uh, I'm getting excited. So thanks for following me along here and let me know what you wanna see in the comments below. See you guys.